I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have you been to America lately? A lot of Americans really haven't. For months, most of us have stayed close to home. We had to. So the next time you get on a plane and visit a couple of American cities, you may be surprised, especially if you remember those cities well from before the pandemic. An awful lot has changed in a short time. Many stores and restaurants are closed. You expect that. Churches are locked on Sunday morning. That's weird. The streets seem empty except for the parks, which are full of the homeless. When you do see people, they tend to be wearing masks and they won't get close to you. It's a very strange experience. The country has changed a lot. The culture has changed a lot and really not for the better. So the question is, how long will this last? How long do we have to endure this? When do we get our country back? When can we live like we used to live back in February? That question is too rarely asked, and in fact, asking it is actively discouraged. At first, you'll remember the authorities told us we could resume our lives when hospital admissions tapered off, when we flattened the curve. The curve stayed flat, and most places it never bent. So we got a new benchmark for when we can get back to normal, when we get a vaccine. Everything will be fine once we can vaccinate against COVID-19. Many in authority told us that. They're still telling us that. The state of Virginia has announced that when a vaccine finally does arrive, it will be mandatory. Not all vaccines. Virginia will not require vaccines for hepatitis or HIV. They won't require a vaccine for meningitis either, despite the fact that meningitis kills a lot more, say, college students than coronavirus does. But once we get a corona vaccine, they're telling us all will be well. But now they've changed that. Not true anymore. According to a new announcement from the World Health Organization, a vaccine, even if we get one, will not be the end of all of this. It will never end. You can get your injection, they'll make you get it, but you'll still be under arrest. The World Health Organization says that finding a vaccine is not the goal. Reordering society is the goal. Quote, we will not, we cannot go back to the way things were. That's a direct quote from the leader of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, who by the way is not really a doctor. Because COVID-19 is not a public health crisis, really, or even a mere virus. According to Tedros, COVID-19 is, in fact, and this may surprise you, COVID-19 is really about global warming. As he puts it, quote, the COVID-19 pandemic has given new impetus to the need to accelerate efforts to respond to climate change. I bet you didn't see that coming. Bill Gates did. He agrees with it wholeheartedly. Earlier this month, Gates posted an essay to his personal website, which you probably haven't seen, arguing that the lesson of the corona pandemic is that the rest of us will have to sacrifice even more to save the earth from warming. Now, for people who are not billionaire global influencers, this is all pretty confusing. Quick, what does the coronavirus have to do with climate change? Well, for one thing, China caused both of them. That's the obvious link. But that is definitely not the point Dr. Tedros and Bill Gates are making. Both of them bow before China. They would never meaningfully criticize the Chinese government. So you can be assured that's not the connection they're drawing. No, for Dr. Tedros and Bill Gates, pandemic and climate change share a very different connection. Both are useful pretexts for mass social control. Both are essentially unsolvable crises they can harness to bypass democracy and force powerless populations to obey their commands. Now it makes sense. Ever wondered why our leaders consider the coronavirus a major public health crisis, but not, say, suicides and drug ODs? Well, this is why. When a 26-year-old mother in New Hampshire drops dead from fentanyl, Bill Gates and Dr. Tedros don't get more powerful. Her death is useless to them, so they don't care. If you actually wanted to improve people's lives, you would look at things very differently, and you would probably reach very different conclusions about the pandemic. In just a few weeks, a deadly virus spread from central China through Europe 
to every major city in the West. And as that happened, the World Health Organization did nothing to stop it and, in fact, spread disinformation as it was happening. Those are the facts. So what would a rational person conclude from those facts? Well, the first and most obvious lesson is globalization has risks. It has upsides, of course, cheaper plastic crap from China, but it also has risks. Pandemics spread very, very fast. Then, as it happened, our most important international public health organization failed on purpose. It's corrupt. The WHO is corrupt. That's a huge problem. That's the other lesson. But no one's learning those lessons. When was the last time you heard Bill Gates or Dr. Tedros say those things? Never. They never will say them because they wouldn't benefit from acknowledging they're true. This is true about all crises. They only take the lessons that empower them. How about global warming? How would a rational person assess global warming? If you really believe that carbon emissions were distorting the Earth's climate, and that's the claim they make, maybe they're right, then you would take a very close look at the forces behind those carbon emissions. You would ask hard questions about the global economy. You'd wonder, who's profiting from this system that's destroying the Earth? How exactly do the richest, most powerful people in the world, that would be big finance and the tech monopolies, contribute to carbon emissions? That would be the first question you would ask. That's the logical way to think about climate change. And if you began to think that way, you might wind up concluding that people like, I don't know, Michael Bloomberg were in fact climate criminals. Their private jets alone produce more carbon emissions a year than entire African villages do, not to mention more than your neighborhood does, a lot more. But tellingly, no one on the environmental left ever criticizes Michael Bloomberg. He's considered a leader in the fight against climate change. On the basis of the numbers, that is ludicrous, but they say it with a straight face and demand you believe it. Part of this is human nature. All of us tend to place ourselves at the center, in the heroic center of our own narratives. That's particularly true of rich people who tend toward the narcissistic. But in this case, they are evading responsibility. They are profiting directly from a system they claim is unacceptable, but it's not their fault somehow. You know whose fault it is? Oh, it's your fault. You're the one who's doing it. You're the one who's killing humanity. You're the one who must change. You've got too many kids. You drive a pickup truck. You forgot to wear your little mask. You're going to hell. Good luck with your bankruptcies and your opioid crisis and your broken lives, middle America. We'll be at the Yellowstone Club having a drink. It's a scam. It's an obvious scam. Here's another data point for you that you won't see on television. Less than a month ago, on July 31st, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, our primary public health organization, funded by the federal government, released guidelines to state health departments about patients infected with the coronavirus. How do you track the spread of this disease? In a footnote in the release, the CDC acknowledged that researchers lack evidence that, quote, masks offer any protection against coronavirus, any at all. As health officials work to track the spread of the virus, the CDC suggested that they ignore whether or not people were wearing masks. In other words, wearing a mask may be completely irrelevant to the spread of the virus. Huh? So there is still no proof that masks protect us against COVID-19? That is apparently the conclusion the CDC reached. It's not something Trump tweeted. The CDC put that in a release to the states. It seems like a blockbuster story. Why isn't that on page one of the New York Times? Why is the entire media, the entire leadership class of the United States of America ignoring this? Masks are obligatory. They're mandatory everywhere. Just the other day, Joe Biden announced that if he's elected, you'll be required to wear a mask when you're alone outside. What is going on? You know what's going on. Fear works. The more afraid you are, the more you will accept. Again, a feature of human nature. The more cut off you are from your family and your friends, the more power they have to control you. This is an election year. Democrats want to win in November. The virus is their main shot to win. Nobody disputes that who's looked at the numbers. They're using fear of the coronavirus to achieve that. For example, polling places. They would like to close more of them. Why to force a vote by mail? Why? because vote by mail is more easy to manipulate. The latest coronavirus relief bill the Democrats are pushing would bring ballot harvesting to every state. What does that have to do with defeating the virus? Nothing. It's not science, it's politics. But here's the key thing to remember. All of us are assuming, and on the right, it is gospel. This will end if Joe Biden wins on inauguration day, no more lockdowns yet. Yeah, don't bet on it. This isn't ending. 
The Wuhan pandemic has made our leadership class more powerful than they had, have ever been. Why would they relinquish that? The only politician in America who has ever given up power voluntarily is George Washington, and they're toppling his statues. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Hundreds of law enforcement agents at all levels are descending on the small city of Kenosha, where local police have struggled to quell escalating violence. The ramping up of law enforcement follows a fatal fight between protesters and a teenager who fired an assault weapon on demonstrators, killing two and wounding one. Hey, he just shot them. Down, Using video from the scene, sheriff's deputies arrested 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse. Yo, man, you're here to start shit, and then when shit starts, you're gonna blame it on everybody else. It was not clear whether Rittenhouse was among the armed militia members who verbally clashed with protesters. After days of looting, arson, and violent clashes, the city has responded with a new curfew. We're not going to put up with what we saw Monday night. We're not going to. Is, does that mean we're going to stop it all? We aren't gonna, it depends on numbers that come. We're not going to be able to stop it all, but we're going to be assertive in helping to protect the city of Kenosha and Kenosha County. The governor has called in a broad array of law enforcement from across the state of Wisconsin, the region, and the federal government. Governor Tony Evers has called in 500 more military troops from the National Guard to join hundreds of local police and sheriff's deputies in riot gear. President Trump offered up federal troops, saying, today I will be sending federal law enforcement and the National Guard to Kenosha, Wisconsin to restore law and order. That federal contribution could be sizable. A law enforcement source tells me that 60 FBI officers and an untold number of federal SWAT officers are coming from Chicago alone, adding to a force that has increased dramatically in recent days. The demonstrations began on Sunday after police fired several shots into the back of Jacob Blake. A black man left paralyzed from a shooting his three sons witnessed from inside the car where he was struck. Wisconsin Attorney General Josh Call says the investigation into that shooting shows police were trying to arrest Jacob Blake following a complaint from his girlfriend that he had trespassed in her home. And Call named the officer involved. Mr. Blake walked around his vehicle, opened the driver's side door, and leaned forward. While holding on to Mr. Blake's shirt, Officer Rustin Shesky fired his service weapon seven times. Call says Blake admitted to officers that he had a knife, later found on the driver's side floorboard of his car. As protests continued past the new curfew, demonstrators seemed undeterred that a massive influx of police planned to shut them down. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, 
despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. A woman was ambushed on a street in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and severely beaten in what police say was an unprovoked attack. Police now hoping surveillance video will lead them to the man behind the violent assault. CBS 2's Hazel Sanchez has more. Police are hoping someone recognizes this man wanted for brazenly attacking a woman on a Williamsburg, Brooklyn sidewalk around 6 o'clock Tuesday morning. Surveillance cameras captured the suspect, viciously beating the 46-year-old woman over the head and body. She's now in a medically induced coma. Locals seeing the disturbing video for the first time were in shock. Oh my this is God. the guy they're looking for. In this neighborhood? Right across the street. Right across wow. the street. Six Police say the woman was walking here on Division Avenue off Rodney Street when the suspect came up from behind, picked her up, and slammed her to the ground. Investigators say he tried to remove the unconscious woman's pants, then ran off. Evelyn Kalis lives nearby. I feel bad for her. Hopefully, you know, she pulls through with no serious injuries. This is tragic. Police and longtime residents of the area, like Jack Klein, say the bearded suspect last seen wearing a bright yellow hoodie and red sneakers doesn't look familiar to the neighborhood. But Klein says these types of crimes are happening too frequently in the city. There has been times where, where it wasn't safe, but I don't think it has ever been that a person could violently attack someone and not be worried to be locked up. Do you worry then about the safety of the people in this community? I worry about my own safety, but I don't go out anymore at night. Detectives were in the neighborhood questioning people about the unsolved assault. Kalis says she won't walk alone again until she knows this attacker is caught. One of the many signs that we're living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5-13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24 verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. Jeremiah 23, 19 through 20. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days you will understand it perfectly. Whirlwind is the Hebrew word, shiara, which means a hurricane. Jeremiah 23, 19-20 can be translated like this. Behold, a hurricane of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent hurricane. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. Right now, we want to get right to the latest on Hurricane Laura. It made landfall overnight with a hard hit on southern Louisiana. And this is the strongest hurricane to hit this part of the Gulf Coast in history. 
and take a look. Video from Lake Charles. Powerful winds tearing apart skyscrapers there. We're already seeing the catastrophic damage caused by this monster storm. Yeah, the images coming in are just terrifying. So let us tell you what we know right now. That monster storm making landfall as a major category for hurricane. That dangerous storm surge as high as 10 feet with winds topping 150 miles an hour. And there are already nearly half a million people without power this morning. Our team is tracking it all across the storm zone. Ginger starts us off from Port Arthur, Texas. Good morning, Ginger. George here in Port Arthur, Texas. We were on the west side of the storm. We escaped some of the worst of it. Just power outages, which we know close to a half million customers are without power. And that number is going to grow. And I'm going to tell you why. Let's go first, though, to this stunning image of when this Category 4 hurricane made landfall. See the lights on the map? That's actually Houston on the left, which was also spared from the storm. The worst of it fell in southwestern Louisiana, Cameron, Louisiana, Lake Charles. That's where we're going to see the unbelievable pictures of damage today. But this storm isn't done with us. We still have a hurricane circulating through northern Louisiana and Arkansas even going to get into those tornado watches and eventually tropical storm warnings through later today. That outer band is going to have that heavy lightning and gusts. We are not going to be done with this for a while. Some of the highest wind gusts reported 137 miles per hour at Lake Charles. That's a preliminary report and I think we may see even higher. Some of the storm surge up to 10 feet. So those numbers could still climb as the water still pushes. But for the most part, we're going to be watching power outages and more inland uh, effects from this hurricane and eventually a tropical storm and we'll lose it by the weekend. TJ. All right, Ginger, thank you. We'll check in with you again. We want to head over to Rob Marciana. He's in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And Rob, as she just mentioned, that area saw wind gusts of 137 miles per hour. Hey, good morning, TJ. The rain has stopped. The winds are beginning to calm down. But I can tell you it was one terrifying night. At sunset yesterday, winds weren't blowing at all. By midnight, this hotel was swaying. Shortly after that, the power went out. And now debris litters this area as, as it does much of West Lake Charles with significant damage being reported here. And now we have the first confirmed fatality from the governor, a 14-year-old girl killed when a tree came down on her home. And I fear we'll see more of that as the reports come in throughout the day today. Hurricane Laura coming in with a vengeance. Overnight, Hurricane Laura tearing into the Gulf Coast. You can see the winds shredding this skyscraper. Whole building is going apart. Making landfall around 1 a.m. local time in Cameron, Louisiana, as a Category 4 hurricane. Oh, God, got to get out, got to get out of the debris. The monster storm bringing maximum sustained winds of 150 miles per hour. This is the uh, ridge, the eye wall. You can see how visibility is going to zero now. Flying debris happening. And wind just blasting us. <laughs> Watch as this RV was flipped onto its side as the storm moves in. Widespread catastrophic damage expected to be revealed. You can see power lines just littering the streets and igniting. Power surges leading to this massive fire. 1.30 in the morning, power just went out here in Lake Charles. The wind is buffeting our hotel. You can feel the building swaying. Traffic signs ripped from the ground. Over nine feet of storm surge reported, described by officials as unsurvivable. The rain has started to come down pretty fiercely, and this is just the beginning. I'm scared to death. Over half a million people forced to evacuate. The entire National Guard in Louisiana activated. Officials warned residents staying in place could be deadly. The grounds of this hotel littered with pieces of the hotel, quite frankly. The sides, parts of the roof, matter of fact, the manager telling me that parts of the roof actually collapsed and this place is really built like a fortress so i can't imagine riding this storm out in a residential home and some people did it in, in mobile homes we'll see how they how they fared right now the winds though although they're less they're blowing upstream so storm surge going to be an issue i think all day long today and debris on the roadways too so water and debris gonna be very difficult for first responders to get around and start recovery Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. 
In the future, during the seven year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16 21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. In Spain's Andalusia region are warning residents about a growing threat posed by an outbreak of the mosquito-borne West Nile virus. 23 people have been sent to hospital and seven of the patients are in intensive care. Dozens of others have been infected but are recovering at home. Well, joining us now from Barcelona is Dr. Jordi Figueroa Borras from the Spanish National Research Council. How serious is this outbreak then in Andalusia? Uh, we have been detecting the virus in Andalusia since 2003, but uh, usually we didn't detect cases in humans. Only in 2004 we had one case in human, in 2010 we had two cases more, and in 2016 we had three cases. And uh, in this year we are having a huge number of cases. So it's uh, the number of people suspicious of having uh, West Nile virus disease is uh, larger than 40. That's, uh, why has it, why has it suddenly come this year and what can be done to protect against it? Yeah, uh, the spring, in particular May, has been very rainy in the, in the area. So we had rains every, every week, one or two days of rain. This is not very usual in southern Spain. And what this has generated is lots of small places with water where the mosquitoes can breed and reproduce. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. After losing ground in Syria and Iraq, the top general of U.S. Special Operations Command in Africa is warning that Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and other Islamic terror groups are now trying to take over parts of the continent's most populous nation. Major General Dagvin Anderson says Muslim terrorists have set their sights on Nigeria's southern and northwestern regions, and the U.S. is now sharing specific intelligence with the country. So this intelligence sharing is absolutely vital, and we stay fully engaged with the government of Nigeria to uh, provide them an understanding of what these terrorists are doing. Their goal? eventually turn Nigeria into a Muslim country and force Christians who make up half the country's population to either leave or convert. Christians are in the eye of the, the target and, and they're coming after them. And the numbers are staggering. August 6th, Muslims stormed four remote Christian villages in Kaduna state, killing 22 villagers. July 24th, 21 dead, scores injured, and several Christian homes destroyed by militants. July 19th, 19 people killed when assailants armed with guns and machetes attacked a wedding reception. And the list goes on. John 16, 1 through 3. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Service is the Greek word latria, which means ministration of God, i.e. worship. Muslims kill in the name of Allah, thinking they offer God worship. The Bible tells us they do it because they do not know the Father nor his Son, Jesus Christ. Leading human rights groups say what's going on in Nigeria is a genocide. If you look at what's happened uh, on the last 20 years, George, it's just massive massive number of attacks against Christians. Uh, look, 50 to 70,000 have been murdered. Allah! 
For years, the main terror group was Boko Haram, which seeks to overthrow the government here and create an Islamic state. They go after Christians and moderate Muslims. They push a hardline Muslim agenda. It is their intention to establish a caliphate and to uh, just rid all of Nigeria and West Africa of any Western influence whatsoever. Now, there's a new actor on the scene in Nigeria's so-called Middle Belt region, where the Muslim North meets the Christian South, a terror group made up of Muslim Fulani herders are killing thousands of Christians. More than 1,400 Christians were hacked to death in just the first seven months of 2020 by Fulani herders. Unfortunately, the secular media are uh, quite often biased and trying to present this as a tribal conflict rather than religious. Nigeria's president, a Muslim, has so far done very little to stop the bloodshed. His police and army are also mostly made up of Muslims. The attackers are never captured, they are not prosecuted. The security services respond very slowly. A, a full day can go on with attacks happening and no security shows up. And frequently, the government officials will provide cover. Helpless and vulnerable to almost daily attacks, leading Catholic bishops are now urging Nigerian Christians to defend themselves. Human rights groups are asking the White House to appoint a special envoy to help end the persecution of Christians in Nigeria. Unless the world takes note and puts pressure, economic pressure, sanctions, uh, visa bans on the officials who are responsible for this travesty and for not reigning in the terror, then uh, Nigeria will continue to be a bloodbath. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets who were before you. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12.26 And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind 
without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.